For today's video, I want to focus on the topic of aquarium plant filtration. I have touched on this in a few of my other videos, but I wanted to create a dedicated resource that I can just link people to in the future since there is a lot of confusion about this in the hobby. Now I will be drawn on a wide range of different sources and research papers for this video so as always you'll find a link in this video's description to my accompanying article that has all of my sources in the footnotes. I do want to start about talking which plants will give you the biggest benefits for aquatic plant filtration in the average planted tank. Technically, all plants will provide at least some level of filtration, but you'll definitely see the most noticeable improvements with high nutrient demand plants, which are usually the ones that grow at a rapid pace. This includes things like fast-grown submerged stem and stolon plants, floating plants, and even some types of house plants with their roots dipped in the aquarium's water. Rather than list them all here, I link to my free low-tech plant index tool that I've been building on my website in the description. I've preset that link to show high nutrient demand fast growth rate plants so you can click on any of them and read the plant profile and decide which ones you like for your tank. Just keep in mind that that tool is still a work in progress and I am planning to add a lot more plants to it over the coming months. Now before I go any further, I just want to quickly say that a plant-based filtration system can work perfectly well and in some cases it can be more efficient than using a technical filter, but there are some downsides. That's because you do need specific types of plants with relatively high amounts of them in the tank with a low to moderate stocking level with a moderate feeding level for this to all work well. So, if you are new to the hobby, I do recommend that you use a technical filter because there are a few different things that can be challenging to balance in your first tank, but plenty of people do this in their first tank without issue. So, getting into the first type of filtration, and you've probably heard about how dangerous toxic ammonia and toxic nitrite can be for your fish and shrimp. Even at moderate levels, they can cause problems that may lead to long-term issues and even prove fatal. That's why it's always best to keep toxic ammonia and toxic nitrite at undetectable levels on your test kit. Thankfully, fast-grown plants can help passively manage both of these with minimal effort required from you. Now, the traditional understanding of the aquarium cycle is that ammonia is converted into nitrite and then into nitrate, but that is the microorganism-driven cycle, which is something slightly different. The plant-based cycle works slightly differently, but all of the additional variables that are required to take part happen passively in the background without interaction from you. Now, the key thing to focus on here is the balance between ammonia and ammonium, known as the ammonia to ammonium ratio. To maintain the ratio, excess hydrogen ions will bond to some of the ammonia that appears in your tank and convert it into ammonium. Thankfully, ammonium is far less toxic than ammonia, and it just so happens to be the preferred source of nitrogen for most aquatic plants. When plants consume ammonia as a nitrogen source, more excess hydrogen ions are required to bond to the toxic ammonia, to maintain the ammonia to ammonium ratio in your tank, helping to passively reduce the toxic ammonia levels in the water. Not only does this manage the levels of toxic ammonia, but due to the plants essentially using it up as a nutrient source, there's also far less nitrite being produced in the tank, which is also toxic. Now, this does depend on how heavily your tank is stocked, planted, and fed, and some ammonia will usually still make it through on the traditional microorganism based cycle so you will have a small amount of nitrite, and then that will be converted into nitrate by the microorganisms in your tank. And that brings me on to nitrate filtration by plants. Nitrate is far less toxic than ammonia and nitrite, but in high enough concentrations, it can still cause problems for your fish and shrimp. The good news is that plants can also help here by removing nitrate from the water without relying on water changes or specialist microorganisms to convert it into nitrogen gas. Now there is some debate on the exact order of preference, but many plants will use nitrate as their second primary nitrogen source right after ammonium that I mentioned earlier. So, once your tank's plants and microorganisms have used all of the ammonia and ammonium in your tank, your plants will naturally begin to process nitrate out of the water as their nitrogen source. 
To try and put this in perspective in all of my established filterless tanks that rely on plant-based filtration, toxic ammonia and toxic nitrite levels are constantly undetectable and my nitrate levels which are far less toxic constantly stay under 20 ppm which is perfectly safe. On top of that, in some of my tanks dependent on stocking, feeding and planting, some of them have undetectable nitrate levels too, but this isn't essential. Now the main thing to take from this section is while nitrate is far less toxic to fish and shrimp, it can result in some types of algae blooms in your tank, so keeping it at a manageable level is still important, but thankfully plants can do this for you. Moving on, and I want to talk about phosphate filtration. A lot of people aren't very familiar with phosphate, mainly because even in fairly high amounts it has little direct impact on the health of your fish. That's why the standard aquarium test kits on the market don't include a phosphate test, so you would need to buy one separately if needed. Thankfully they are very affordable, but most people in the hobby just skip them altogether. However, phosphate is a key macronutrient for plant growth and while it often enters our tanks through fish waste decomposition or leftover food or other decaying matter, it can get surprisingly high surprisingly quickly. So while your plants will always be using phosphate to fuel their growth and health, if your tank is overstocked, overfed, underplanted or lacking in regular water changes, phosphate levels will get high enough to cause problems with algae. In my tanks there is a consistent pattern of once phosphate levels climb above 0.25 ppm on my test kit, hair algae starts to appear in the tank. The good news is that phosphate issues are fairly easy to manage in the majority of tank setups and partial water changes or just adding more fast grown plants can bring the levels under control surprisingly fast. Now there are chemical treatments out there for dealing with the hair algae growth but personally I always try the natural methods first. The main challenge with hair algae growth is its dense structure because it's far tougher than soft algae types such as brown diatom algae or soft green algae. That means that even once the excess phosphate levels have dissipated and the hair algae is essentially in its melt phase it can still take many weeks or even months to fully melt away. That's why it's important to be mindful of your stocking, feeding, water changes, planting levels and the types of plants you keep in your tank. So moving on and we get to silica management and I will only keep this one short because it's really only a temporary issue for newer tanks. But there is research that suggests aquatic plants can absorb significant amounts of silica from the water. To my knowledge silica isn't harmful to fish in realistic levels you'd get in an aquarium but it does fuel one common problem most aquariums including my own have which is brown diatom algae. The majority of aquariums will experience brown diatom algae growth during the first month or two after an initial setup. That's because this specific type of algae feeds on silica in the water column and this not only comes from your tap water, but any sand, gravel or hardscape rocks in your tank leaking it into the water column. Because this is a temporary spike at the start of your aquarium, these algae levels will dissipate by themselves over time. But depending on your setup, various types of aquatic plant can also use that silica to support their growth and reduce the amount of brown diatom algae grown in your tank. Next up I want to talk about hydrogen management and this one really isn't a form of filtration if I'm honest, it's more of a passive benefit that comes with keeping the right plants in your aquarium. Now if you're new you might be wondering why you need to worry about hydrogen management in your aquarium. And although there is a few different reasons, the main one is something called old tank syndrome. One of the key symptoms of old tank syndrome is the gradual buildup of excess hydrogen ions in the tank which slowly lowers your tank's pH level. Over time this can make it more difficult for microorganisms to maintain the nitrogen cycle and keep everything stable and then it will eventually lead to spikes in toxic ammonia and toxic nitrite levels in the tank resulting in a crash and serious risks for your fish. The good news is that this is surprisingly easy to avoid with either partial water changes or the help of suitable plants. To understand why we do need to understand where these hydrogen ions are actually coming from in the tank. In a microorganism driven nitrogen cycle that uses archaea and bacteria to convert toxic ammonia into toxic nitrite and then into nitrate, hydrogen ions are naturally produced as a byproduct and there's no way to stop it. 
So if they aren't removed from the water column, they will accumulate and gradually push your tank's pH down over time. Now, regular partial water changes are easily the most common way to flush these out, but plants do give us another option. As I mentioned earlier, plant-based filtration significantly reduces the amount of ammonia, nitrite and nitrate in the tank. Due to your plants dealing with so much heavy lifting, you only need a small microorganism colony in the tank to act as a backup so there's far fewer excess hydrogen ions being produced. On top of that, as I mentioned earlier, the conversion of toxic ammonia into the far less toxic ammonium that the plants use as a nutrient source requires a hydrogen ion. So not only are there far fewer hydrogen ions being created in the first place, but the plants are also actively managing their levels by forcing them to be used up to convert toxic ammonia into the far less toxic ammonium. This can help naturally balance the pH level in your tank and stop that gradual decline which may result in problems if you don't also do partial water changes. Moving on and I want to touch on copper filtration and again I will keep this one brief because it is a little bit more niche and mainly for people who keep shrimp and snails in their tanks. Copper can be highly toxic to invertebrates and different side effects range from something as simple as slightly changing the colour of the shrimp all the way up to proven fatal. But the thing is, different species of invertebrates have very different copper tolerance levels so it is difficult to say keep it under this exact amount. Thankfully, plants use copper as a nutrient source so that alone should be enough to keep it at a safe and stable level and not pose any risk to your shrimp or snails. On top of that, a lot of species of plants can also hyperaccumulate copper in their plant tissue as a defence mechanism, but more on that later. So, if for whatever reason there is a spike in copper levels in your tank, your plants can absorb that via hyperaccumulation, even if it's above the levels of their nutrient source requirements. And that brings us on to heavy metal filtration, and I know that copper is a heavy metal, but I just wanted to give it its own section just because it is more of an issue for anyone keeping shrimp and snails. But in high enough levels, there's plenty of other heavy metals that can end up in our aquariums that can still cause problems for fish, shrimp and snails. Again, partial water changes can be the standard way to keep these in check, but once again, plants can also provide a natural alternative. There's countless research papers out there from the phytoremediation industry on just how effective some species of plants can be at absorbing heavy metals in our water supply. Here's two charts showing the absorption rate of duckweed and Spiridella polyrhiza showing how many heavy metals they can accumulate in a surprisingly fast period of time. As I touched on earlier, plants do this in two different ways. First, they use certain heavy metals as a nutrient source to support their growth and general health. But the second method is the hyperaccumulation that I mentioned in the copper section where the plants can essentially store far more heavy metals in their plant tissue to try and make the taste of their plant matter bad as a defence mechanism against herbivores. So again, if for whatever reason there's a sudden spike of other heavy metals in your tank, then your plants can absorb it way above the normal nutrient source because of hyperaccumulation. But there is one extremely important caveat to keep in mind with this specific advantage. Heavy metals in your plant tissue that are put there via hyperaccumulation aren't broken down or used up in any way, they are simply locked away inside the plant tissue. So, if that plant matter starts to die off inside of your tank for whatever reason, those heavy metals will simply be released back into the water column and potentially cause a massive spike. Thankfully, it's very, very easy to avoid this and all you have to do is regularly trim your plants and remove any excess plant growth from floating plants and things like that. Not only will this physically remove the excess plant growth from the tank, but it also removes a lot of those stored heavy metals with them and totally removes this risk. Finally, I do want to cover salt filtration with aquatic plants. Now, before I go any further with this section, I want to be very clear, this is not a realistic issue for an average aquarium in any way, shape or form, so this is less relevant to the vast majority of people. The only scenario I can really imagine where this might be an issue is if you are intentionally adding aquarium salt to your tank to try and treat a sick fish, but even then, you really should be doing it in a separate hospital tank or quarantine tank, just because it can interfere with your beneficial microorganism colonies. 
So while this isn't realistically helpful because in my opinion this is not a risk for an aquarium, I did want to include it in the video because there is a lot of misinformation around this topic in the hobby. Some content creators do choose to push the idea that plants can't fill a salt as a way to argue against father fish doing minimal water changes, but in doing so they are spreading misinformation and kind of becoming a bit of a joke on the planted tank side of the hobby. Now for the record, I am not a fan of Father Fish. Personally, I think his method is heavily flawed and I link to my Wallstad vs Father Fish article in the description that goes into far more detail. But my channel is all about spreading research backed information so I wanted to try and clear this up. So the usual claim goes something like this. You have to do water changes in your tank, not just water top ups to counter evaporation, otherwise salt levels will keep building up in your tank until they become a problem. The logic comes from the idea that natural waterways such as rivers and streams have constant outflow to prevent salt build up. But for whatever reason no one's pointed out the obvious that rivers, lakes and streams don't just collect pure rainwater, they are fed by groundwater which has travelled for many, many, many miles over bedrock, through soils and different other contaminants picking up a lot of impurities along the way. This is why most natural ecosystems required constant flushing of their water supply because the inflow water is highly contaminated. Thankfully, our aquariums are completely different because the vast majority of people use safe drinking water as a water source for them that has minimal contaminants in them, so this is not a valid comparison between natural waterways and planted tanks. And then there's the argument that plants can't absorb salt. I know this is obvious if you're on the planted tank side of the hobby, but just for beginners, liquid fertilizers, which a lot of people use in their planted tanks, are literally nutrient salts dissolved in water. That's all that's in the bottle. But surprise, surprise, the plants can use up those nutrient salts without issue as a nutrient source. Now, what a lot of people who spread this myth actually mean is that plants can't absorb sodium chloride. But again, that's not true either. There's an entire emerging industry currently being set up around this exact process of using plants to deal with sodium chloride buildup. It's called the phytodesalination industry and it's being developed as a response to climate change which is increasing soil and freshwater salt levels in certain parts of the world, causing various problems. Now this is a fledgling industry in its very early stages, but the research papers I've read on it have shown that plants can be surprisingly effective at removing both sodium and chloride from the water. Now if you've got a lot of experience with pond plants, you might be expecting that halophyte plants which have evolved in salt marshes are the most efficient, and while that is technically true, at least one research paper has found that glycophytes which have evolved in regular water conditions aren't that bad at absorbing salt. Again, the research paper's in the footnotes of the accompanying article linked in the description, but it found that halophyte plants were able to absorb 0.78 milligrams of chloride per gram of fresh plant weight added via growth. But it also found that glycophytes were still able to absorb 0.45 milligrams for the same amount of growth, so that's a far smaller gap than most people would expect. Other studies have backed this up, showing that certain plants can absorb significant amounts of sodium and chloride from water too. Like I said, this is a fledgling industry in its very early startup days, so they are focusing on marginal plants from the pond side of the hobby, rather than actual aquarium plants. Like I said at the start of this section though, if you're using safe drinking water to fill your tank, there's no real source of sodium chloride going in there. Yeah, there are small amounts, but plants can absorb the tiny amounts that are going in. In my opinion, that's why the content creators who spread this myth never link to sources or anything realistic. It's always theory in their personal emotional feelings on the topic. Now, I know this section might have been a little longer than the others in this video, but it does really bother me when people, in my opinion at least, are intentionally spreading misinformation in the hobby to push their own agenda with no fact checking. It takes less than 15 seconds to read the Google summary on this topic and the science is clear that plants can absorb realistic amounts of sodium chloride that could end up in our aquariums. Anyway guys, that brings the video to an end. I hope it's been helpful. Thanks for watching and good luck with your planted tanks.